Welcome back, ladies and gents. On today's show, a Jeep with half the doors, a Gymkhana star with a Subaru badge, and a track day special with a jet fighter roof. Plus, Tom Cotter from Barn Find Hunters stops by to show us his very own personal barn find. You're welcome. I'm Tiffany Stone, and this is Haggerty's Daily Driver. Let's buckle up. If you guys know me, you know that I love Jeeps, and I've been especially excited about all the upgrades for the latest generation of the Wrangler. But sometimes less is more. So that's why when Jeep showed off their Wrangler 392 concept, I wasn't just excited about the motor, but actually about the factory spec half doors. And for those of you who don't know, a half door is kind of what it sounds like. In place of a heavy door with a power sliding glass window, you're going to get something with plastic windows that's lighter and more open. It wasn't clear if they'd make it to production, but a spy photographer captured this new two-door Jeep Wrangler Rubicon with half doors. As you can see from these photos, the doors have more of a classic look with a lower belt line that matches the top really well. And while the lighter half doors probably aren't a full season solution if you live anywhere cold, they're going to be perfect for warmer climates and the summer. But of course, they're going to be the best for wheeling. Now, if you've seen just one car video on the internet, it's probably one of Ken Block's Gymkhana videos. <laughs> For the first two Gymkhanas, Block was in a Subaru, but he switched over to Ford for the next videos in the series, and Subaru fans were heartbroken, lowering their flat-billed hats over their eyes to shield their tears. But cry no more, Subaru bros, for your one true god, Travis Pastrana, is back with this. It's the 2020 Subaru Gymkhana STI. Basically, this is the most extreme variation of a WRX imaginable and draws on the work Subaru Motorsports USA and Vermont Sports Car put into their rally cars. With no limits, Travis Pastrana and his team made a wide body car that's mostly carbon fiber and has a completely unrestricted motor. It looks insane. Now we're awaiting for full details of what they did to the car and of course, for the next installment in the Gymkhana series, but until then, enjoy some freedom-loving tire smoke. <laughs> Lovely. Now, if you want something that's full of carbon fiber, but your tastes run more Mario Andretti than Ken Block, allow me to present the, the KTM Crossbow GTX. The Austrian company, known for building racing bikes, debuted the Crossbow more than a decade ago, and it's been a favorite for a certain kind of track wrap. The Crossbow GTX is the most extreme version of a Crossbow. It's basically a turnkey race car with a standard Recaro competition seat, racing wheel, homologated roll cage, and six-point racing harness. One of the coolest tricks is the Jet Fighter canopy, which has no mirrors, but instead uses cameras to show the driver what's happening behind the GTX. And that's a good thing, because with a low weight and an Audi Sport turbocharged 2.5 liter motor putting out 523 horsepower, most things will be happening behind you. According to Car Scoops, pricing is around $271,000 in Europe, and the car can only be driven on the track, unless you live in Saudi Arabia. Coming up, the one and only Tom Cotter stops by to show us his very own personal barn find. But first, are you subscribed? Tom Cotter is, and he's up next. Hit that button. Welcome, Tom, to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. You know, I know it's so great to meet a fellow Haggerty personality, and everybody has been commenting on YouTube that they wanted us to connect, so I'm so thankful for this. Cool. Awesome. Well, I know we've all been in quarantine and everything. Can you give us a little insight on what you've been doing to pass the time in quarantine? Well, spending a lot of time here, and, and this is my garage. My house is over there, but this is, this is kind of my toy chest. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I really, I'm glad that we had this opportunity because people who are fans of Barn Find Hunter just think I'm like, I kind of talk the talk. I go around the country looking at stuff and then I take showers and put on nice clothes. And, and that's not the way it is. I walk the walk uh, and I actually drag home cars and work on them. And, and behind me is my 
is my latest project. Uh, I'd love to show it to you. Of course, yeah. Our producers told us that you're working on a Lotus, so I'd love a little walk around if you have the time to do that. Oh, I do. I mean, I, I can only spend a week on this phone, you know, on this, uh, because I have nothing else to do. But <clears throat> this is a, a Lotus Elan, uh, 1964. It was a uh, barn find that I dragged home from McPherson, Kansas. I'm on the board of a college in McPherson uh, that auto offers an automotive restoration program. And one of the professors came up to me and said, you like those little foreign cars. Would you like to uh, look at a, a Lotus Elan? I said, sure. So I went there and looked at it and wound up buying it. So it's all been disassembled. It, it had been off the road since the 70s. Um, I'm going to show you uh, the, the chassis. I mean, everything is so small and so light. This is the chassis right here. And the chassis is made of tin. So I can, I can just. Tom, you're so strong. I love it. So, you know, it, it weigh, the, the chassis weighs about 40 pounds. The body weighs about 150 pounds. And I can actually go and pick that up too. That is amazing, Tom. Wow, you weren't kidding. So, I mean, a little bit over 215 pounds-ish. That, that's amazing. That's so cool. So the, the whole car with the, you know, it's got a twin cam motor and stuff, weighs, uh, I don't know, 1,200, 1,300 pounds. Uh, and, and one of the best power to weight ratio cars in the world. I've, I've driven about everything there is. And it's the best sports car I have ever driven. And I own a bunch of sports cars. Um, so I decided this is going to be, you know, maybe it's my last restoration. They take years and years to do right. I'm going to try to have this uh, completed probably in the next – 12 to 18 months. The engine's out being rebuilt. The chassis is about to go and we've already sandblasted it in the backyard. Uh, and it's about to go get some welding done to, to reinforce it further. And then I've got, you know, I, uh, a lot of parts that I've restored right here. I've got a glass bead cabinet back there, glass beaded or sandblasted the parts. I just, uh, this is what I'm proud of. I just restored the steering wheel, uh, revarnished the wood on there. Uh, I, the, the dashboard came out pretty cool. It's uh, it's a wooden dash, and I I don't do woodwork. I mean, <laughs> do I look like a woodworker? But this, you know, the, the the original wood finish was in bad shape, so I sanded it down, and I went and I I bought some uh, uh, veneer, and glued on the veneer on here onto the old plywood. And, and varnished it. And man, I'm really happy with the way that came out. So, you know, even though I can't put the car together because these parts are over here and this part's over there and I, I can still restore all these components and put it back together. So this is uh, a Lotus Salon that I own. Over there's a Lotus Salon my son owns. So when this is restored, we're gonna jump on that one and, and we'll have a father and son team here. That makes me feel so good. I think I, you can't tell, but underneath I have some goosebumps because that's always awesome. I love the, the father son or a fi family dynamic. I think that's so awesome. Um, you know, I'm a novice barn fine hunter. I've never actually found one, but I know you are an expert on this. So what's a piece of advice that you give myself or any of our viewers who want to become a barn fine hunter or become like you? Well, uh, you know what? You don't need an advanced degree to go out and, and find things. And, I guess uh, I've, I've been doing it so long that things that other people, uh, I don't know, how do I say it? I, 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 I just do things naturally where other people have to learn those traits. But literally, I've been doing this since I'm 12 years old. I've written uh, 10 books about barn find hunting, and I'm writing another book right now, uh, which I'm not sure what the title will be. It could be something like Zen and the Art of Barn Find Hunting. No sex, no violence, <laughs> just rust. <laughs> Well, that's the working title. Uh, so, you know, wherever you are, wherever you are watching this right now, I bet within five minutes of where you are, there's a car that you didn't know about. Um, five minutes, 10 minutes away from where you are. And you can get there, you know, by car. You can walk there. You can take a bicycle. Sometimes the slowest form of transport is the best because it gives you a moment to stop and, and peer around that fence a little bit more carefully. Uh, 
some of the things that I do, Saturdays and Sundays are the best days to go barn front hunting because people open their garage doors to do yard work. They're raking. They're, they got lawnmowers out. And, and the, the door that's closed six days a week to their garage is open on the 7th while people do maintenance around their house. So that, that's a good opportunity. Not long ago, I found a neat Jaguar in a garage buried with blankets and shovels and snow. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, sleds and stuff. Um, barn fine hunting, depending on where you live in the country, barn fine hunting is better in the winter time because leaves are off the trees. Your vision is a lot further. Um, make friends with people that can go on private property legally. Make friends with UPS delivery people, <laughs> FedEx delivery people, police officers, landscapers, because they go on people's property. Uh, that's how I found the first Cobra I found was a, a propane delivery man peeked in a garage, saw this covered up sports car, thought it was a Triumph, and it wound up being a Cobra, and that was my first Cobra in the barn. That is amazing. I know you've got some uh, projects in the way, obviously the Lotus right behind you, but what's for you on the horizon? Anything that you could let myself and your fans and fans of Haggerty know about? Well, uh, writing, writing a, I mean, I've been doing a lot of writing and reading during this pandemic and running. Writing, reading, and running. <laughs> uh, I just ran the Boston Marathon virtually, um, and so I've got the jacket. So like, that's all that matters now. Um, reading, I just read, uh, uh, Tim Considine's twice around the clock, all the Americans that ever raced at Le Mans, it's about 1200 pages. And I also read the, the two volume set of, uh, Briggs Cunningham's biography, his cars, his life. That's about a thousand pages. Um, so I'm writing a book on barn fun hunting. I'm also writing a book on the Briggs Cunningham uh, assault on Le Mans, the, the 24 hours of Le Mans, 1960, where he bought three cor Corvettes there, the first Corvettes to ever race at Le Mans, and uh, actually wound up winning his class. It's a great story. Uh, what's on the future for me? Well, I'm waiting for Haggerty to allow me to get back on the road and do some more car finding. Just before the pandemic hit, we were in the UK. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we, we found a bunch of e-cars, just around a, a, a nice little swath around London, there's lots more cars to be found. And it, it, it gave me the hope that maybe we could start traveling around the world um, as well as in the United States. We've been to, oh, probably 28 states right now. Now we've been in two countries, the US and the UK, but I'd love to be able to regularly go to Canada, Australia, I think France, uh, Sweden is a big car capital and, uh, you know, I, I, maybe even some kind of funky place like Poland or the Czech Republic or something just to see what's over there. So I hope that, you know, I hope Mikhail's watching this right now because Mikhail, I think we can do a good job there. Awesome. Well, if you end up doing that, maybe you could take a novice like me, show me the ropes, see uh, what's out there. And we definitely want to check out your personal car collection. So maybe we'll save that for another uh, episode if you're down. Yeah, and you're invited, but you're going to get real dirty. I promise you that. It's okay. I work in motorsports and off-road. I uh, live in dirt. I probably have ate so much dirt I could fill up a sandbox. So don't worry about that one. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, thank you, Tom, so much for joining us. Hopefully, we can make this a monthly thing. I definitely want to hear more about your book. And then once the Lotus is done, you have to show us all about that. Thank you so much, Tom, for stopping by. Happy hunting. Same to you.